Welcome, Dolphins fans, haters, and everyone in between to your favorite show discussing the greatest franchise in sports, the Miami Dolphins. This is the Fins Pod. My name is Moose, your host, and although the status of quarterback Tua Tungavailoa is still up in the air, we do know one Dolphin who will be suiting up this weekend for sure. Big Splash free agent edition, Will Fuller, the former Houston Texan and perhaps one of the fastest wide receivers in the National Football League. Today, we're going to talk about his game, his specific skill set, and how that could help the ailing Dolphins offense. His impact could really be greater than a lot of you realize. Let's get to it, and let's dive in. I, I'm, I'm still confident with my speed. You know, I, I do a lot of work in the offseason, speed, strength. So, you know, uh, a lot more than I did when, earlier in my, in my uh, career. So I, I feel good. You know, I feel good where I'm at with my speed and my strength. If, you know, in a defensive room, the, the first thing they tell the DB is don't get beat deep. You know, don't don't get beat deep. So I use that to my advantage, you know, just, just play as fast as I can. And that gets the defense on their heels. And, and like, like I said earlier, uh, we got a lot of speed. So, you know, a lot of guys can do that. Taking a step back, going back to the spring specifically, the Dolphins were coming off of a promising season. Ten wins. The defense had established themselves behind head coach Brian Flores. He showed he could coach a disciplined unit, one that really made it tough for opponents to put the ball in the end zone. That's a winning formula when combined with a good-to-great offense. One half of the equation seemed to be figured out, but there was definitely work to do on the offensive side. Specifically, when you looked at the team, it was clear something was missing. Rookie quarterback Tua Tungavailoa was throwing to the likes of rookie wideout and a wide receiver convert in Lynn Bowden Jr. You had veteran Mac Hollins, who, although a solid special teamer, is not some stud on the outside. Although, don't tell Raiders fans that this week. Jakeem Grant Jr., need I say more about that one? Seventh-round rookie Malcolm Perry, who isn't even on the team anymore, as well as seventh-round veteran Isaiah Ford. NFL cast-out Antonio Callaway made a cameo in there as well, but aside from a hobbled Devontae Parker and Mike Kosicki, the cupboard was barren. Very barren. Chris Greer had work to do. They had to surround their young quarterback with talent. Talent that could elevate him, and in turn, once he was ready, he could then elevate to near-elite status. And it all started with free agency. There were some big names out there. You had Juju Smith-Schuster, Kenny Galladay, Marvin Jones... Curtis Samuel, even a guy like Marvin Jones. All of them had different skill sets, and plenty of them, namely Juju and Galladay, got big paydays. As we have come to learn, for better or for worse, this Dolphins regime prefers the economical route. They wanted the best bang for their buck, and to be honest, they got that. They found a pretty good deal. Veteran wide receiver Will Fuller was on the market. He was having a career season in 2020 for the Houston Texans until he got popped for a PED suspension. Probably why he was having that career season. But his suspension, as we all know, ran into the current 2021 NFL season. Innately, that lowered his bargaining power across the league and ultimately lowered his contract price. He knew he was not going to get the deal that he could and he wouldn't be able to maximize his value in the current situation that he was in. So he gambled on himself, and the Dolphins were that team he took the gamble with. He signed a one-year, $10.57 million deal with Miami. Well, below perhaps what he could have gotten, he did know that the Dolphins plan to utilize him frequently, thus inflating his value for when he hits the market again next offseason, where he can hope to get that mega deal. Fuller knows that if he shows out again, He's going to be in line for a significant pay raise considering his age and his unique ability on the football field. He just turned 27, still in his prime, and his speed looked to still be at that elite status that it was at when he was taken in the first round by Houston back in 2016 out of Notre Dame. So what kind of player is Will Fuller exactly? Well, he runs a 4-3-2, and it translates with pads on. That doesn't always happen with players. He can take the top off of the defense, and he has really great hands while deep down the field. He doesn't drop balls often. That speed forces corners and safeties to play off of him, respecting it. And through the years, he's refined his route tree so he can then capitalize on that space that these defenders are giving him. Whether that's deep comeback routes, crossing routes, quick screens, curls, as long as your offense is functioning properly and you have a semblance of a running game, Will Fuller can take chunks of yardage from the defense. 
That's the type of receiver he is. To address the receiving core, Miami didn't just add Fuller. They drafted fellow speed demon Jalen Waddle sixth overall. Despite their analogous speed, they are completely different players, though. Jalen Waddle is more versatile. He has a higher ceiling. He's better after the catch and generally tougher to bring down. He's able to make way more guys miss, therefore being more dangerous underneath. That's why the addition of Fuller is going to help Waddle so much. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. We will touch on that in a bit. Will Fuller is six feet tall and can haul in contested catches down the field. Unlike a Mike Wallace, he does fight for the ball. So how exactly can George Godsey and Eric Studesville and the Dolphins use Will Fuller to maximum effect? Well, in my opinion, we should be moving him around. I do not want to see him exclusively on the outside like we do with Devontae Parker. Similar to how we send Jalen Waddle in motion, do the same with Fuller. Give him a jogging head start to try to manipulate the defense to create space for him. And when I say move him around, I don't mean have him in have him in the slot running like short routes that slot receivers generally run. Like I said, he's not that type of player. He's not a yak monster, and he can't really make multiple guys miss in the open field. That's more Jalen Waddle and Albert Wilson's game. You want to have Will Fuller running intermediate to deep routes out of the slot and the outside as well. Make sure to utilize the mere threat of his speed to keep the safeties back and help your offense at large. Essentially, I expect the Dolphins to have an oxygen tank with his name on it for when he gets back to the sideline because he should be 20 to 40 yards down the field on nearly every single passing attempt. Because first, that opens up the deep game. You can take shots with Fuller outside because he can actually create separation, huh? Now, that's a word we haven't heard in a while. Separation for a Dolphins wideout? Wow, I'm pretty funny. But that's the reason Miami targeted him over a guy like Kenny Galladay because we have the physical outside guy already in Devontae Parker, and you have that physical slot kind of receiver in Mike Gesicki. We lack someone to complement Parker and Gesicki on the outside. Now, we don't. Come Sunday, with Fuller donning the aqua and orange for the first time, be sure to keep an eye on the exact types of routes that the Dolphins have him running. I'm not saying we shouldn't sprinkle in quick screens, slants, and other generally shorter routes for the veteran wideout. Keep the defenses guessing. Of course you want to do that. But I don't want the Dolphins to cut themselves at the knees by limiting Fuller's deep ability. Keep him going down the field over and over again. Hope that you get a big player or two to help change the general tide of the game. The other reason I hope to see him going deep is the ripple effect that it's going to have on the rest of the offense. As a defense, when you have a guy faster than every single one of your DBs on one side of the field, and then you have a big-bodied physical receiver on the other, you have to make sure you're matched up well. You have to be cognizant of those matchups every single play. To make matters worse, then you have a real threat underneath two. That's Jalen Waddle. That's who I think benefits the most with Fuller now being brought into the fold. And we'll get more into that on the other side of this. Winning season has started off hot. Maybe not so hot for the Dolphins, but my bookie's continuing to crank up the heat with a $50,000 survivor contest. Whether you're a new or existing customer with MyBookie, if you make a deposit, you'll earn an entry into the 50K survivor contest for absolutely free. To play, all you have to do is pick one winner a week to keep that streak alive and have a shot at the grand prize. Start off strong with the Ravens pick against the Lions, who haven't beat Baltimore since Lamar Jackson was in second grade. Or ride the Steelers, who are looking to get back to that historical dominance over the Bengals, who suck. Hell, if you're feeling lucky, pick the Dolphins to take down the Raiders for the second straight season. Either way, it's simple to play and win even if you don't have a ton of betting experience, which is why I always choose my bookie for NFL games. Head to mybookie.ag now and get in on the competition. And use our promo code FINSPOD to receive double your first deposit and get instant access to the 50K Survivor Pool. Again, that's promo code FINSPOD to instantly double your first deposit. Bet anything, anytime, anywhere with my bookie. So moving back to Jalen Waddle and how he benefits from the addition of Will Fuller. Think about what we've seen so far. In Miami's three wide receiver sets, we often see a combination of stalwarts Devontae Parker and Jalen Waddle, usually on almost every play, and then a rotation of Albert Wilson, Preston Williams, and Jakeem Grant. Aside from Albert Wilson, who could play on the outside, allowing Waddle to be in the slot, no one else is really a threat opposite Devontae Parker. You hope Preston Williams can get back there, but again, he's coming off a major injury. 
That would allow, not having a real opposite threat from Parker and having Waddle in the slot, that would allow defenses to crowd up because they're not worried about the other receiver on the outside and then take away a lot of underneath stuff from Waddle's arsenal. And then, in other instances, you would just see Waddle having to play on the outside, something he's definitely good at and something he can develop further, but as of now, is not his primary strength. Remember, Waddle is a guy you want to get in space. Let him make guys miss. He's best used in motion, in the slot, or in bunch formations. Generally, those are the best ways to get the young speedster out in the open field. But the way Miami's receiving core was constructed in weeks one and two, the Dolphins didn't feel the full impact of what he can be because the defenses were able to key in on him and give extra attention to his route, thus limiting our options as an offense. Now, you don't have a hobbled Preston Williams, a crap Jakeem Grant, or rusty Albert Wilson on the outside. You have Will Fuller. If defenses want to cap, continue to play Waddle and give him the respect that they have, then you can capitalize by taking shots downfield with Fuller. Waddle can now play that true position, and a three-wide receiver set featuring Devontae Parker, Jalen Waddle, and Will Fuller? Guys, things are going to look way sexier than they normally do in South Beach. Having Fuller is also going to help Devontae, albeit not as much, but defenses will have to reassess those matchups, and that could favor Parker, allowing him to work against a lesser corner than he normally would have to, absent of the new Dolphin, Will Fuller. Now, if things go well, and you're able to use your weapons properly, then the defense lifts, trying to stop that deep passing attack. What you can do now? Feed your running back and keep pushing the ball downfield. The main point, Will Fuller's presence alone changes the face of this defense and if things can be done right and Tua comes back ready to go then we're going to be talking about a much different looking attack for Miami I'm excited for his return to NFL action the only real concern and it's a fair worry Fuller missed a lot of time on the field in training camp and so his chemistry may not be there and where it eventually will be down the line now it's the NFL so it's your job to get that timing down regardless of all these excuses so I won't let that be that major excuse if things don't go well but it's something to be aware of in case things don't go well which right now they have not been speaking of things not going as planned the offensive line look I know I just spent time talking about potential, about what this offense can be, attacking defenses down the field, utilizing your speedsters, but none of that potential can be reached if we don't improve the offensive line play. And it appears that the coaching staff agrees as the team will be going through some shakeups, specifically according to Barry Jackson of the Miami Herald, the far superior journalist when compared to Armando Salguero. Thank God he's out of our market. But good old good old Barry released quite the tidbit out of Miami Gardens. The Dolphins will have a different starting five on Sunday at 4.05 p.m. The change? Miami has benched left guard Solomon Kinley in favor of second-round pick Liam Eichenberg. Look, I'm just happy something is being done, and hopefully Eichenberg's pass-blocking ability will aid the line as a whole. But to be honest... This isn't exactly the move that I wanted to see. If you listened to yesterday's episode, and I recommend that you do if you haven't, and hey, we'd appreciate a subscribe too if you haven't yet. Appreciate that. But we spoke of potential changes to the line in that episode. The major issues with the offense has been the play of the two starting offensive tackles, Austin Jackson and Jesse Davis. I would much rather have seen Eichenberg come in to replace one of them, preferably Jesse Davis. I did not think Kinley was the biggest issue on the line. Again, the coaches know more than us. At least, we hope so. And maybe they feel Eichenberg's chemistry with Austin Jackson on the left side will improve the unit as a whole more than if they just plugged in a brand new tackle. That's the thing about offensive line play. It's not necessarily about your top five offensive linemen. It's about the combination of five who play at the highest level when put together. The team had all training camp to try different combinations, so if they feel like this is a better one, so be it. Remember, Liam Eichenberg was being cross-trained at tackle and left guard, so it's not like they're just throwing him at a spot he has no experience in. He did get reps in preseason there as well. But just no Dolphins. We as fans just want results. No more excuses. The performance that we saw on Sunday, from their pure blocking ability to the constant mental lapses across the board, that shit has to get out of here. This team will never reach the heights they're striving for if the line doesn't improve. We all know it, and it's not even really needed to be stated. We've heard it dozens of times in the last 48 hours. It just is what it is. Perhaps Austin Jackson plays better now with Eichenberg. Maybe the reaming Jesse Davis got in the film room, combined with that guilt of having actually been the one to injure his quarterback, will lead to better play from the veteran. 
At this point, if Barry's reporting is true, which it almost always is, we know the five guys who will go. I'm nervous as hell to watch them go out there against the likes of Max Crosby and Yannick Ngakwe, who have been having great starts to the season, but we just have to pray to the football gods. And the last thing we're going to touch on today, rookie Javon Holland. First, can I say he is perhaps the best-looking Dolphin out there? And no, I don't mean in terms of attractiveness. I'm just talking his look in pads. Damn that number eight hits, and those armbands he wears are sick as hell. I'm a fan of the aesthetic. But the best part is that if you come out wearing accessories like that that draw attention to yourself, you better be able to back up that look with good play. So far, we've been getting exactly that from Javon Holland. He's being nudged along a little slower than I would like, splitting reps with Jason McCourty, but it's clear that his ceiling is way higher than McCourty's. He's shown to be solid in coverage on the back end. His tackling is superb, which was the knock, well, not the knock, the compliment of him coming out of Oregon. And he seems to be around the ball very often. Again, he led the nation, or at least tied with uh, other corners as as a safety with most interceptions in the college football world. So that's a good trait to have as a safety. He's explosive and much faster on the field than a lot of people think. Overall, I see why the Dolphins drafted him where they did. So far, he's been exceeding already high expectations in this limited run we've seen. According to Pro Football Focus, albeit take that for what it is, they're not always right, but Holland has been the highest graded rookie across the NFL in the first two weeks. You heard that right. Not just the highest rated defender, the highest rated rookie. He's doing his job. And if you listen to his press conferences, you see he is a Flores drone. He's either bullshitting all of us, which is very possible, or he's eating this new Dolphins culture right up. And that's great to see from your young studs. And that's what Holland is becoming, a stud. If he continues on this trajectory and makes even more impact plays for the defense, we'll be saying Minka who in short order. Remember, Holland had the heads-up recovery of Brandon Jones' fumble. That play right there, the fact that he jumped right on it, didn't try to pick it up, do too much, he just pounced on it. That's the kind of play a smart football player makes, a player who shows that the game is not moving too fast for him. The fact that we're already here with Javon Holland this soon into the season is exciting. I look forward to seeing his growth throughout the season. Aside from Javon, which Dolphin has been the most pleasant surprise for you? Has it been Jalen Waddle? Because, I mean, the rookie's on pace for nearly a 1,000-yard season despite some early drop issues. Or is it the veteran wideout, Devontae Parker, who has come on strong as well? Perhaps you've had your eye on the defense rather than the offense, which I know a lot of us have been choosing to lean into because, again, Sunday, horrible. And if you like what you've seen from Ogba or the continued eliteness of Xavier Howard, let us know in the comments below if you're watching on YouTube or if you're listening to the audio version of the show, tweet at us at FinsPod so we can talk about some positives in these otherwise dark times. Like I said before, now that the season is in full swing, so are we here at the FinsPod. We'll be having near daily episodes, and in the coming days, we'll be looking at the Raiders matchup specifically. How do the Dolphins fare against the 2-0 Las Vegas Raiders? Be sure to subscribe to make sure you do not miss a thing. And remember, Finns forever up. Uh, it felt great to be a part of that takeaway. When I had seen Brandon uh, scoop it, I was juiced. So I was like trying to run and go block somebody, and then uh, the tight end had like stripped him. I said, oh, snap, ah. I was like, ah slide over there and uh, I just got up on it you know we have this thing uh, in practice called like city or country if it's if there's a lot of space and pick it up and scoop it and score but if there's like people around get on it um and so I saw people around got up on it shout out to Agua because he jumped on top of me because I knew that there was a lineman by me he was gonna try to like jump on top of me it might have hurt but Agua you know he got on top and protected me um and then in terms of the like the snap count and stuff like that that's just you know package by package really um it's not necessarily like a uh like starters or anything like that. It's just like package by package in the game plan. So, uh, yeah, that was that. I was just excited to be out there and having fun, especially in the first home opener and my family's there and everything. I was enjoying myself. That's going to do it for us here today. Thank you all so much for listening to the Fins Pod. Hope you enjoyed it. Thank you to Timothy Ritchie and Brian Googer, members of the pod and supporters of the show over on Patreon. Check that out. Links in the description or head to patreon.com slash finspod. Thank you all so much for the continued support, and please remember to like the video if you enjoyed the show, and subscribe just so you never miss a chance to chat about your Miami Dolphins. Remember, the Fins Pod's available on all platforms, Spotify, Apple, and Google Podcasts, and of course, here on YouTube. Continue the conversation with us over on Twitter and Instagram, at FinsPod. I hope you all have an amazing day, and until next time, stay safe. Love y'all. Love y'all.